Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Hello, hello, hello. You know how I like to start the show. I always give a round of applause to all the people who showed up, who took time to listen to us, to be with us. So let's give them a round of applause. high and for those who haven't been here we don't prescribe we don't tell you how to, to interpret who that is we don't tell you to use a particular name we don't tell you to follow a certain book or a certain philosophy everybody is invited to this round table this is a show in search of God in search of the ideal, in search of a higher power, in search of community, in search of brotherhood, in search of peace, in search of understanding, whatever that ultimate superior unifying factor, empowering factor is for you, as long as it is peaceful, as long as it is respectful of others, as long as it gives the people around you the ability to also peacefully engage in what they believe. And this is about respect. You know, and uh, today's show is interesting because we learn to live with it. <laughs> and you know, every every message that we have is a message about that unifying factor and how we strive towards excellence. So we will not purposely give off a message to polarize. And I understand because because this is a time where we're, we're so polarized. Um, but we always want to give off a message. And the way that we do that, you see how you have to stick to what you you know, what, what your modus operandi is. You have to stick to what you, what really drives you. And we always start with a prayer. You see how we can get off, everybody can get off track when you, you start with your name. So we start this name in the name of the Most High. You know, whether you call him God, whether you look at him, and you, then you, when you whether you were invoking Jesus, whether you were invoking, and I'm not saying that God is Jesus, or that's not what the conversation I'm saying. What I'm saying is whether you, when you sit down and you meditate, you're thinking Buddha. When you sit down, you sit down, you think about the, the teachings of uh, the Prophet Muhammad. If you think about the Torah and Moses and, and Abraham, if you think about the Gita, the Bhagavad Gita, however it is, if you sit down and you just revel in family, whatever your call is to that higher power, we start this show in the name of that higher and you will find power. And it, it's a Sometimes it seems like a lot to grasp on. I had a friend tell me recently, he was like, man, <laughs> he said, uh, one second you're praying to this and the next second you're praying to that. And I, and I had to admit, it was kind of my experience. Um, you know, my, my grandmother was a bishop in a Christian church. My aunt, her daughter, uh, introduced me to Islam. And I've experienced everything in between. I have Jehovah Witness friends, and we have great Bible studies. <laughs> you know, we attend a Methodist church, and I think that everyone's journey is is unique. And that I, I believe that, and I don't speak for God. One thing that I heard someone say that you know we have to be careful as we care to interpret you know what we believe God wants us to say. We, we got to be really guarded with that, you know. I hope and humble myself to the possibility that God would use me in some sort of way to speak to people. But, you know, you take away from it when you, when you mix it up with that. So I believe as I look at back in my life, if, if I measure my life, that having multiple religious 
experience, theological viewpoints helps me to be able to sit down and see the connection between them. You know, we always we often think that things are in in in, uh, in conflict, but getting back to the modus operandi today, you know, we we. You know, today is a, you know, today as we say, you know, this time that we look at, I believe, is a is a major turning point where we're starting to look at ideas differently. We're starting to look at things and situations that uh, that many of us may even believe have been around for some time, but there's a turning point. There's a change in 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 uh, in, in conversations. You know, and obviously a lot of it has precipitated from, you know, I think the coalescence of a lot of the violence because it's been around, it's been known, you know, the inequities when, you know, when you start to get to having the ability to look at big data. And then you can compare just, you know, the groups of people who are being incarcerated, you know, inequities and in incarceration and, um, and when you see that there is so many disparities, and just when you look at information, you know, there's something that we all knew about, but it, it has coalesced recently, you know, and when, you know, with the slaying of uh, first Ahmad Arbery, you know, I definitely want to, to, to make sure that I put his name, you know, and I don't, I'm not putting his name in anything, but I want to make sure that I mention his name you know, often, because I think that uh, with everything that has happened with George Floyd, that, you know, and rest in peace, I mean, never can I or should I ever say someone's name and just, you know, especially in what transpired and say it so loosely, you know, rest in peace to Ahmaud Arbery, rest in peace to uh, George Floyd. And, and the thing is that, you know, what I try you know, because I, I easily get, you know, like anyone else, I get polarized. And I think we all do. When we hear something that's impassioned, I think we all have the, the natural feeling, especially when you feel like you know, there's a wrong, to right a wrong, you know. And I think that we're called to, you know, when we know that certain things are wrong, and that's what the name is that this show implies. You know, what are the things that we learn to live with? that we kind of knew weren't right, you know, on all sides. Because I think, you know, in order for us to have a real conversation, we all have to take ownership. It's not a us, them. It's not a, hey, you know, now black people aren't getting their chance to talk up about all the things that have been done wrong to us. You know, we know that. We Everyone knew it, you know. And I think that in, in certain things became normalized, and uh, and it all almost became, you know, shoved to the side. You know, the conversation became different. But we knew, just in looking at data, not in perception, that, you know, the inequalities. But they're not just inequalities for people of color. They're inequalities for all people who find themselves disenfranchised. And whether that's disenfranchised because of lack of education... whether that's being disenfranchised because of a lack of, of finances. You know, you can even be disenfranchised for a lack of health care. You know, I know people who have a pretty decent amount of education, <laughs> you know, and, and, and you would say, hey, they, they make enough money that they have some extra money to do some of the things they want to do. And they may not even have health care. Right? So, you know, these people are people who find themselves at a disadvantage. And I think that's the crux and in in, in what is the power in what's happening now. Because we're at a turning point where we are willing to identify and not just live with it, you know. If the concept is that uh, those, you know, those that are most powerful are those who deserve most the spoils and those who do less. You know, I hear that conversation a lot. You know, 
especially those who it's interesting because those people who feel like they're high activity, high output, you know, they always shine the light, you know, well, if I did less, you know, but I think we do have a responsibility to each other, you know. We do have a responsibility to make sure that if there's a group, any group that is not being heard and that is being treated disproportionately, or that's just, is that is disproportionately vulnerable. You know, and that's what it's about because I think when we use the words like deserve and it throws people off because people think, hey, you know, if I have... You know, a mansion is because I worked hard for it, and if you didn't want to because you didn't want to work and you want to, that's that's like the concept. It's the us and them. You know, we 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 we're just people that want to work, and you're just people that don't, and that's why we have. And you know, but when you, we're not talking about individuals. We're talking about if you have a group, any group that's disproportionately vulnerable. It can be women. Just think about it. you. We, we we live in a country where women had to fight for their rights to vote. So in essence, they were told, look, you don't, you're not as good as me because you were born the opposite gender. So you don't, your, your voice doesn't count. I mean, we know it. And again, we know it. We may not talk about it. We, we, we have advanced, you know, our daughters have gone to college, right? But we come from not too far in generations where women were expected, where they were acculturated to be vulnerable, right? Dependent on their male counterparts, on the quality of his decisions, right? So we have a, we have a responsibility to them. How about women in the workforce? We found out through data and through revelation that women were being underrepresented, mistreated, not only underpaid. I just want you to think about this. They had to come to work, deal with men. And you men, you come on, we know how we are, right? They had to deal with us, right? Then they got paid less. Then they were put in the situations where they were mistreated. Like, how is that right? That's that's so there's a group of people who are American. Right? The only only difference by gender, well now we just again we're just changing it. We're not talking about race or creed or fine, gender, and they had to fight for what was already there. So in essence, intellectually, right, if we're more advanced now, we like we realize, hey, women should be able to do what so then we so we were wrong then, right? In essence, we're saying we were wrong. Some people say, Oh, it were different times, right? But maybe we were wrong, right? Do you, do, you know, it's, it's great. You know, everyone wants the wife that stays at home. But do you want your daughter? You want your daughter to do whatever she wants to do. Isn't that sort of a, 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 um, a hypocrisy? So again, this, this, this movement, this turning point, bearing witness to the things that we knew were not really that right, but we learn to live with it. And it's not about shaming anyone because I think we all can learn to live with things that we know are not right, that we feel strongly about. And we pick and choose. It's like the serenity prayer. You, you ask God for the wisdom to know between the things you can change and so there's things that we, so if we want to change them and we can't change them, it still means we feel as passionately about it, but we just can't change it. And to know the difference and to have the patience and the serenity of heart to, to be able to live with it, right? So this is not about pointing out that, you know, you know, people get polarized. And again, I can't talk down the strong emotions that people feel who have encountered the same experiences that I've experienced. I feel them, you know? And people get tired of it, right? You know? And I think that we, we and I'm glad to see that we live in a generation that people are just not going to put up with it, right? 
but it's not a it's not a black and white. It's not a Republican and Democrat.